And, and, and I'm going to go about and figure out what that way is and, and help provide a solution for a need that I see. Welcome back to Season 3 of the Shared Practices Podcast. I'm here with my co-host for the season, Dr. Jonas Ashbaugh. And him and I Hello, haven't, re- haven't talked in a while, so we've been catching up here off air. Uh, how's it going, Jonas? Hey, it's going great. I want to say congrats to George for becoming official Dr. Harari. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Congrats. Just, it's been good. Um, I'm I'm pretty happy about it. So it's been fun to get my license here in Arizona, and uh, I'm excited to get started. So um, we'll t- we'll get into the show today. Uh, we have Dr. Philip Gordon on, and I'll have Jonas. Why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest today? Yeah, this is Dr. Philip Gordon. Um, we actually have a uh, you know we actually were, live nearby to each other, but we never actually met. And, and until he started doing his podcast. Um, you know, I never actually had, had spoken to him before. Um, and I was aware of him doing a startup um, back when I lived out in Kansas City. And, um, you know, I, I knew of the area he was in and was always curious about it, but just never had the confidence to go up and talk to him until we started doing a podcast together. And I finally reached out. And uh, I'm a big fan of his podcast, The uh, Dental Implant Practices. If you haven't listened to it or subscribed to it, it's a good one out there. Um, he's got some pretty high caliber um uh, guests on there just talking specifically uh clinical stuff you know implants and, and things like that but um you know if you don't follow him he is becoming you know an implant guru out there um i was really curious in in, in terms of his startup on how he was able to design a implant you know focus practice um because he says in this podcast that the the majority of the income is practice is through implants. Maybe they make up like 30% of what he does. He does do everything, but, but really in the most recent months, it's, it's really starting to tailor specifically towards implants. And I was really curious on how he, how he positioned himself as that implant authority in the community. Cause there's so many dentists that want to be that. So that's really what I was trying to get at in this, in this podcast. All right. Well, we'll jump to the interview and then we'll get your thoughts on that in the outro. Sure. All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Shared Practice. Uh, I am Jonas Ashball, today's host, here today with Dr. Philip Gordon, uh, host of the podcast you probably heard of, Dental Implant Practices. Today's, uh, today's topic is about Philip startup. So uh, many of you may or may not know that, that Philip himself has done, a, has done a startup, and I'd like to have him on to discuss uh, how the experience was and what he went through in putting that together. And so today I'd like to welcome him on board and, and thank him for sharing his uh, experience. Yeah, Jonas, thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Not a problem. So uh, yeah, first question out of the gate, uh, why startup? Why, why transition from what you're doing to doing a startup? You know, that's that's a great question. I think, you know, a lot of dentists get out and, and start to do uh, right out of school. They, they may think they have a vision for what they want to do for their practice and their career. And then you get out and actually get into dentistry a couple of years and realize, uh, you know, how things really go uh, and how maybe your vision has changed. And so, you know, for me, it was kind of taking a, a, a mid early pivot in my career and say, okay, here's, here's what I know about myself. Here's what I know about dentistry. Now, you know, what, what, where are my likes and dislikes? Let me figure out a way to uh, do more of the things uh, that I like to do at, at a spot that I want to do them at. And so a startup for me kind of just seemed like the, uh, the best way to do that. It it sounds like that was your, your vision. So you wanted to, you know, exercise your vision and didn't want to, uh, you know, buy into somebody else's shoes, so to speak. Yeah, you know, there's lots of uh, opportunities for practice ownership nowadays. Obviously, there's buying an established practice. There's doing a startup. There's entering a partnership. There's, you know, the DSO market with various levels of uh, ownership. But for me, you know, I waited four or five years of working as as an associate in my father's office, which gave me good exposure, but ultimately realized that, you know, my dream was different than his. And so, I thought, okay, how how do I go about achieving what I want to be and what I want to do? And I think having that that vision, I think, is the first best step, you know, before a startup, knowing what you want and knowing what you want things to look like in the end. And then, okay, work your way backwards. And and maybe that's acquiring a practice or maybe that's starting one up. But, you know, that's 
that's a different pathway for different people. Yeah, absolutely. And so what does that look like today? Are you still doing days in the other office? Or are you full-time committed to your startup? Well, I was, I was in a good situation where I was working four days a week uh, and had some flexibility. So I cut my schedule at the associate office down at my father's office down to three days a week and, and committed two days a week to my startup. Um, and then was able to just, you know, ultimately I was working two and a half at both. And then I switched over to two days at my father and three days at mine. And now I'm at uh, one day at the other office and four days at mine. So I, I do work five days a week. Um, but I'm, I'm at my office basically full time now, four days a week and at the other office one day a week, uh, primarily just doing implant work. I don't, I don't know how you do it. Four days a week, one in another office, running a podcast and, and, and we were just talking, doing, doing a, a full massive course continuum. That is an amazing workload for any human being. That is, that's exceptional. Yeah, it's, um. A, a passion of love for mine. Obviously, yeah. it, it it has its commitments, um, and sometimes you know those can be taxing on the family life. But those are those are the things we all balance, right? Everyone's got oh yeah stuff on that balance. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, doing your start, how did you settle on the location that you're in now? Well, I and, and that goes back to the practice vision. You know, my vision was to have a uh, mature practice in an area where I could do implantology, uh, which means that my segment market was going to be kind of the baby boomers with a good, stable financial situation and a mature market. So, you know, I, I kind of pegged that as my geographic location, um, started searching out uh, areas of the, the metropolitan that I lived in that maybe fit that criteria, had good exposure, uh, visibility, you know, dentist to population ratios, and um, uh, just kind of started working backwards, knowing what my vision was, and then that left me a couple places. And then it was just about trying to find a deal and and make a deal work. Yeah, you, I mean, you bring up an uh, interesting point, like saying you want to do do implants. Now, you know, a lot of people, obviously, every dentist around these days wants to do implants. That, that's pretty hard work for you know a startup to really break into break into, like. How are you? How how did you break into that uh, being brand new on the block? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I, and then, like I said, that kind of went back to my demographic search. I wanted to. I wasn't at the um, new, expanding, growing neighborhoods where you know young families were going in. I went back kind of into the the fully developed, mature part of the town where uh, the population average age was fifty and up, knowing that those would be the people that needed my service. Uh, after that, it, it came down to uh, marketing and, uh, you know, getting the team on board. We just said, OK, we're going to be an implant practice. We need to diagnose implants. We need to diagnose comprehensive dentistry. We need to, you know, focus on this and, and market ourselves externally and internally towards comprehensive implant dentistry. Yeah, I'll ask you like two things. So is your is your first message? So you're I'm, I'm assuming you did mailers. To get your message out, or is there a mix of other marketing in there? Well, I definitely did some mailers, you know, and, and I and I had great success for my mailers for the first year. Um, I'm not sure now. I just did another round of them. I'm not sure if my exposure is is effective now, so it's it's not as new. So we're not getting as much maybe uh, hype out of the flyers. But at first, those were a good resource because. Um, it seems like the older, more established dental offices in my area, you know, really had kind of quit marketing. Uh, so for me to kind of move in and start the mailing campaign, I, uh, you know, feel like they actually went pretty well for the first year. Yeah. So was it more of a value message? Was it, you know, my implant for this much money or is it, I, you know, I'm, you know, Dr. Philip Gordon, I am, I've done these courses. I am this qualified to do these implants on you. You know, what kind of message did you use to bring in those patients? Uh, you know, that's that's a great question. I, I think, you know, a lot of people, even in a even in a luxurious area, will still resonate with a value message uh, because who doesn't like, you know, a, a good deal? Now, mm -hmm. on, on that token, I, I, I still, you know, remain that, um, you know, a, a good deal is relative. We're not giving dentistry away, but I, I think you can offer 
you know, second opinions, free free comb beam scans and uh, and uh, consultations, you know, certain amount of money off implant treatment while still affording a, a, a decent fee uh, and, and not diluting the product. So I, I definitely think you can take an angle with that. And because it's more than likely comprehensive care, there's, there's still, there's still money to be made. Mm-hmm. And, and the second part of that is, you know, you want to frame your practice as being in, in, in this, say you want to, you have framed your practice as, as providing, you know, comprehensive care. But what does that look like? Are, are you, you know, what do you, how do you do that? Is it, is it full, full mouth photos? Is it, is it something different that, I'm, that, I'm, that, I'm, that, that you're doing to, to uh, provide that? Well, yeah, I think, you know, a lot of that can come down to uh, patient experience and uh, customer service. So, uh, you know, comprehensive patient care, you know, to me doesn't mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm prepping 32 teeth. You know, comprehensive care means to me that uh, the patients come in and they've been heard, they've been listened to, maybe given an evaluation of their uh, condition and, and given multiple solutions. Uh, so I, it doesn't necessarily have to be that people are doing lots of dentistry and spending lots of money with you. It can just mean that, you know, you do have a consultation room. Uh, maybe it's just a single room uh, and, and you do a complete exam with, and you take your time and you take photos, x-rays and, and offer them a solution that maybe they've never been offered before. So it doesn't have to be extravagant, but I, but I do think photography and x-rays and uh, comb beams and you know, a good presence can definitely, you know, enhance that process. Yeah, yeah I, I, I can definitely pick up what you're saying. Uh, it, definitely think about a presence, like the way you deliver it and presenting yourself as, as Dr. Lee and, and uh, giving them a solution that maybe they haven't heard or giving them multiple options that, that maybe they haven't heard before. That, that sounds, sounds great. Um, are you actually working up the case in front of them on like a on a, like a three D implant software, or are you going that far to present solutions? Well, you know, typically, if, if it's a comprehensive case like cosmetic or implant, what I will do is have my staff member bring them back, kind of get their story, you know, make a little one on one chat, figure out what what's really motivating them. You know, is it is it function? Is it is it embarrassment? Is it aesthetics? Is it is it pain? You know, maybe take a a set of uh, pictures, maybe take some corresponding x-rays or a comb beam. And then I can, I can walk into the room, meet the patient, review the information and, uh, you know, come up with a couple of treatment plans on my head right on the spot and just say, you know, where do you really want to go with this? Are, are we getting out of pain? Are we fixing your smile? Uh, do you want to take a look at, at total oral health? Um, and then, and then kind of start talking with them within, the, within those limits. That makes sense. So going to your startup, so how, so when did you open in, in, in what year? Um, it was actually the, uh, the end of 2014. The end of 2014. Yeah. And um, do you remember how many patients you, you had that first month? Well, it was, um, you know, an interesting process. You know, you, you go through and you, uh, you know, make all these plans and take out all these loans and, and go through a process of building out. And, um, you know, you, you just wonder how things are going to go. I, I, I think, you know, what, what people worry about is, you know, am I going to be able to pay my bills? Am I going to be able to pay my staff? Am I going to be able to cover it? And, and our patients going to come and see me. I, I think you have to approach it in a way that, you know, maximizes your potential. So starting out, you know, you have to be kind of lean and mean, but you have to have opportunities to grow. So, you know, that, that first month, yeah, we probably saw 30 patients, I would say, you know, but you have to make each one of those count when you've got the, well, those are the only 30 patients you've got. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, And how many, how many square feet did you build out? I built out, uh, at, at the, uh, office we're at now, I am at you think through. I think about twenty seven hundred square feet. That's a that's a good size practice. And, and how many ops is that? Well, I've got seven ops in there. Yeah, and that, that's, uh, that's not bad at all. Yeah. No, I I tried to use the uh, 
you know, I, I went to a breakaway uh, program before I did the build out. And, uh, you know, they really kind of opened my eyes to, uh, you know, a slightly different way of, of thinking. You know, they're pretty extreme in their in their processes, but there's there's some good truth hidden in there. And so, um, you know, I think, you know, Henry Schein would have probably laid out five opportunity, five operatories in my, uh, you know, 2,800 square foot space. And, I, you know, I put in seven and a consult room and a private office and, a, you know, and a lab and a you know, two bathrooms. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's fully maximized. And and I think that's the key is, you know, kind of know how you want to practice beforehand, put everything you want in there. But after that, you know, really squeeze every inch you can out of it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, most listeners that are pursuing a startup, uh, you know, I firmly believe that that breakaway is an obvious prerequisite for doing a startup because, uh, you know, startup is, is not easy. It is not easy, and you got to get. Um, the, you never know when you be ready, but you got to be as ready as you ever be. And uh, I think there's no, you know, at, right now there's no better place to prepare yourself than getting down to breakaway and finding out what to do. At least getting a manual on what to do. Um, so, I, so I definitely agree with you there. So you start to 2,700 square feet, seven ops. You know, start with about 30 patients. Uh, the first month, do you, do you remember when you broke even? What, what was the, one of the first month you, that you broke even was? Well, <laughs> you know, there's always a funny story to some of these. I can't remember the first month I broke even, but I, I remember the first month I started paying myself. And I guess I guess maybe that's the same thing, right? Um, uh-huh. Yeah. You so know, what, what month was that? I, you know, I, I am embarrassed to say this. It was, uh, because of the situation I was in, it, it, it was about a year into the process. And, uh, now, now let me preface that by saying, you know, I, I had another job that it, that was paying my bills. So as the months would go on, as the business would do better, I didn't necessarily take that, uh, pay. I took that uh, profit and put it back into the practice. So it's not it's not a true definition of break even because you know when we have a good month, I would take the extra money and I would do I would do more marketing for the next month and then I would you know I would invest in it in, in another system right and and upgrade another X you know Y or Z or you know buy another piece of equipment. So that's why I like the opportunity of being able to work at one place and do your startup at the same time. Now, you know, maybe during those couple of years while that transition's going on or the or the year, you know, it's going to be very stressful and taxing and maybe work a lot, but you know, I didn't have to scrape for every dollar knowing that I had to, you know, pay my bills and pay my house and provide for my family. And some of that early profit I just put back into the machine and kept things going. You know, I hired another cheap coordinator that I didn't know if I had uh, the money to do. But as soon as I did that, the practice took another big step, you know, and it was to buy a comb beam if you want to do implants and, you know, upgrade to various softwares and, uh, you know, more x-ray sensors and, and things like that, you know, so it really kind of depends what model you're in. You know, I don't think I could have grown as quickly if I had to take that as profit, but because I didn't have to take that as profit and turn it back into the uh, the business, I, I could you know, expedite growth maybe quicker. So more of that after the break, but first a quick word from our sponsor, Q Optics. Okay, so what's the deal with side shields? Like apparently, according to OSHA, you have to have a centimeter of protection behind your eye line. So on either side, your glasses have to wrap back and protect you from blood and splatter and everything. So Many, many, many loops don't extend a centimeter past your eye line from the side from a lateral view. So they have to add these dumb little plastic side shields and they break, they fall off. Then you've got one of them or you've got one that kind of attaches funny. They don't allow your glasses to fold, your loops to fold in quite right. I love that the frames that Q-Optics put out don't require side shields because they wrap around far enough. They do their job. They're they're both eye pro and magnification. I know it's a little thing, not a big deal, but it's the little things that that I love, including the case. 
Every other case that I've had for my dental loops, either it's this teeny little box that doesn't fit my battery and the loops and the side shields and everything else, or it's a briefcase. I mean, how hard is it to make a small, convenient, protective case that's just big enough to fit the whole package with everything attached, but not a 1940s briefcase that you need to check when you board an airplane? Q-Optics has just thought about these things, and rather than doing it the same way everyone's always done it, they've made something better. So if you're ready to upgrade your experience with your loops, email sales at q-optics.com. Yeah, that, that, that sounds about right. It sounds about the, the first six months is about, you know, breaking even. Six months through a year is about uh, breaking even and uh, growing capacity. Then, then year two is about, you know, m- making money. I mean, that's what I, I, I yeah. hear that's, that's about the cycle. Um, so you're, you're right on pace there. You're, you're not... You know, you're not below average, you're not, you know, not above average, but you're, you're right on course where you, where you should have been. So, you know, bravo to you for, uh, for doing that. But what, did, what did your team look like when you opened? Was it one assistant, one hygienist, one front desk? What, what did that look like? Yeah, I, I, I always had it in my mind that I wanted a hygienist to do the hygiene. And so it was, it was a part-time hygienist, you know, two days a week, and, and the schedule was probably half full. Uh, it, it was one front desk and one assistant. So, you know, it was pretty lean. I think I think you could probably start out, you know, uh, leaner. But uh, that's not that's not the path I chose to go down. You know, I, I know a lot of dentists do their own uh, profies for a while at first, and, and that that can work great. But at a certain point, you know, you have to, you know, rise above and do things that pay the bills at a higher level if you can get someone to do the other things. So. It's it's definitely a fine line there between, you know, when to get your next staff and, you know, when to quit doing things yourself and move on to the next level. While at the same time, you know, you don't want to be paying uh, hygienists just to sit around and answer phones. So it's uh it's it's kind of a fine line between hiring them, kind of almost before you're ready, but then having everybody realize, okay, we've got this person here, we gotta we gotta make it happen now. So it's a uh, it's kind of a fine line there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, w- I would say def- definitely following the breakaway model. It wouldn't, it would, you know, you would, you would not have the hygienist. But uh, I, I have many friends that have did start with the hygienist, and you know, the overhead might be higher, but you know, they're, they're able to do those higher value procedures, working those same days, and, and just open themselves up for more opportunity. Especially you, you know, framing your practice as an implant practice that, that might be. I, I can see how that that would be valuable to you. And so, did did you start with a cone beam? I heard you mention that. Did you buy a cone beam after you opened, or immediately when you opened? Um, you know, just shortly after, though. Um, it was it was in that second year that I did. So even though I was still placing implants in that first year, there was a uh, a cone beam center I could refer patients out to. Now that added an extra step in the in the practice, but you know, being in a big city, there's always, you know, centers that you can refer patients out to you get your cone beam taken. So we did that until uh it it just made good business sense for me to own my own. And and it wasn't necessarily based on, you know, ROI from charging patients. It was okay, I if I had this in my office, I could scan this patient, we could sign up the, the treatment plan today and do the dentistry in a day or two or next week, as opposed to send them to a scan, you know, wait a week, get that, and then treatment plan them and wait a couple weeks and get them back. And so it was more so the cone beam was uh, facilitating the dentistry. And uh, so that's kind of how I went about through that process. But it was based on, on, on a need base from flow. But if you have access to a scan center, that's a good way to start out. It started out pretty lean, but I'm sure it's essential to what you do now. I'm sure you couldn't go back without it. It is, yeah. You know, implant dentistry is probably 40% of my production uh, in the office, not just out of my schedule. So uh, doing what I do without it would be impossible. But, yeah, if, you know, my, I went, I still went with a pretty lean machine, though. I went with a Vatec, and, and, and it covers from TMJ to TMJ. And, and uh, uh, it doesn't collimate, but it takes the big picture, uh, CBCT on the front, and then a true pan on the back. and. I got that from Benco 
uh, for sixty five thousand delivered and installed in Texas. So it was uh, it was a pretty good deal when you really think about that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, are you taking the CBCT on every patient that walks in the door? I'm not. No, I I, I think some of that's overkill. You know, I mean, I take it for pain patients that come in and it, uh, you know, it might be difficult to locate exactly what's going on or I want to see where an abscess truly is. Um, I, I take it on patients that, that might be considering implants, you know, maybe patients, uh, we don't do a lot of, we don't do a lot of ortho. Uh, we do some Invisalign. So, you know, obviously we might take it for those patients, but really um, diagnosing uh, failed root canals, diagnosing implants, you know, w- w- was really the main thing for it. So I, I, I'm not a firm believer that everybody has to have one of those, but it, it's basically taking the place of my pano. So if somebody might be due for a pano and bite wings, we'll, we'll just take that every five years. Sure. Uh, would, would you say there's there's one thing that you do that, you know, has, has you know, transitioned your practice from just a regular startup dental practice to an implant practice? What, was there, is there one thing that you do that, that brings in those patients? To, to come and see you to get implants placed? Well, you know, I, I had, uh, you know, been in the industry a, a little while and, um, I could kind of see in my mind where the, where the breakdown of the gap was. Right. And, um, you know, I, I saw it as, you know, there's a lot of patients out there that, um, that don't go to a specialist that, that never, never take up the referral slip you know, um, don't have the extra time and cost and money that it takes to maybe see a specialist. And I realized a lot of these implants just weren't being done, right? No fault of anybody, but, you know, uh, patients don't want to go see another doctor. They don't want to pay higher fees, you know, so a lot of this stuff just went by the wayside. And, and I, and I kind of got to a point in my career, I thought, you know, I know there's a better way and, and, and I'm going to go about and figure out what that way is and, and help provide a solution for a need that I see. Sure. Is there is there a piece of marketing that you touch on that 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 you feel brings in these patients that that's helped well, accelerate this process for you? Yeah, you know, I mean, I I think you know from what I tried to do with my website, it was um, you know, touch on those touch on those cases that I think people can relate with. You know, um, you know, talk about you know, are are you in pain? Do you have are you missing one tooth? You know, does you have an ill fitting denture? you know, address the problem with the marketing, not necessarily, okay, we're going to place an implant. You know, d- patients still, uh, didn't, uh, they don't know what implants are. They just know that they're the, they're the, they're the, like the cool thing in the industry. Um, so you want to talk to their, uh, specific problem. So when you market, market towards, you know, ill-fitting dentures or, you know, bridges that don't work or, you know, uh, uh injured teeth. So I, I market towards the, towards the, um, the problem and the solution. I don't necessarily market implants. Uh, and and to that note, you know, making videos uh, of yourself and your staff to put on your website, you know, to kind of humanize and personalize yourself. So I think people can relate with that. And then I think you know, being being targeted and specific to your market. You know, if if you want implants, it's um, you know, most people coming in for implants is for a failed old root canal tooth with a bad crown on it. You know, those are. Those are, you know, 50, 55, 60 year old patients. So if, you, if you're marketing towards, you know, 25 year old millennials, those aren't implant patients. So, I mean, you know, know your target, know the, know the outlets that they, that they do, you know, radio hasn't been very good for me. Um, you know, old people, I say old people, I mean, you know, the boomers and up, they, uh, you know, they still get their mail every day. They, they still read the newspaper. They still, they still watch TV. So. They have, you know, habits that were acquired years before. Now, obviously, Internet's still a great place to be, but, you know, don't go away from traditional media outlets if, if that's your market. Uh, and, and, and for me, you know, those traditional markets have still been pretty good. You're saying, you know, like uh, advertising in the, the obituary section or, or yep. in uh, yep. leaflets in, in traditional newspapers and things like that. and. Uh, Instead of saying missing tooth, you say you say have trouble eating. Yeah. Or, or you, you name the problem as opposed to do you need a tooth? Yeah, I I try to look at the solution and you know th- think of the consumer. They're not flipping through the newspaper thinking, oh, there's a shiny screw in someone's face. They're thinking, okay, I've got this problem. You know, can somebody fix it? And uh, you know, I try to put myself in their shoes. Okay, you know, what's a what's a sixty year old who's got 
a bad smile and an ill-fitting denture trying to do. Okay, well, they're, you know, they're getting up in the morning, they're reading the paper, they may go listen to the sports radio in their car, they're going to check their mail, re- you know, and and pick up the uh, the local, you know, the local magazine lifestyle section. So and I, I think I think advertising um, to those specific medias with your specific message can be um, very impactful. You know, whereas ranking number one in a major metro for dental implants might be hard to do. You know, we've got a clear choice in this city, and and that's great because they educate my patients. But I'm not going to out pay per click um, clear choice by any stretch of the imagination. But I but I do think you have to have a strong presence on the internet. I mean, don't get me wrong; that's still that's still king of the media. But um, you don't have to you don't have to spend you know, insane amounts of money to do so, I don't think. Well, I touch on marketing because, you know, being a startup, marketing is... It's king, yeah. What you need to do, yeah. Absolutely. You got to get yourself out there. And uh, it's going to be a huge part of your, your budget, of your of your working capital. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. From month to month uh, until you until you start cash flowing and even after you start cash So, uh, yeah, that's, that's why, you know, like... I, th- I think situations are unique, you know, we want to start up and, and framing as implant, you know, and there's so many dentists that want to do that. And it's just so hard to do that, you know, um, it is, but it is because, uh, you know, I mean, day to day, are you still doing, I guess you said 40% of your practice is, is, is implants, but you're still doing bread and butter dentistry or, or do you have an associate doing it? Now? No, you know, I, I definitely am the only, uh, dentist there. I, uh, I I do all the dentistry that comes to my door. I mean, I uh, I don't enjoy working on, you know, kids a lot, and and I'm not very talented at it. So I mean, I do defer amount. I add a lot of pedo. Um, I don't do any any bracket uh, braces in my office. I do some Invisalign. So um, other than that, it's you know it's it's bread and butter uh, general dentistry with uh, some cosmetic and implant in there. Uh, you know, I, I, I dream about only placing implants one day and having an associate do the rest. But I think if I did that, I'd probably go crazy too. So it's probably good to have a good mix. And that way you always have something to look forward to. You know, you have those procedures that, you know, I don't like to do this, but, um, the patient needs the service and, and it, it, it pays the bills, but then you have those services you're excited about and that, you know, keep you coming back every day. And, and for me, those are the implants. And so I, you know, I look forward to those on my schedule. Uh, my my team really gets excited about it. They help me uh, impact my patients' lives in a real inspirational way, and um, that that's why we do uh, try to focus on that because it's it's good for them and it's good for us. Pretty good. Uh, any, you know, if you had to do it again, uh, you know, can you tell us what you want to do and, and maybe what you would do again? What what has worked for you? You know, I, I know some people when they're looking at startups, they're looking at, you know, all the cost and it's like the cost, the cost, the cost. So you want to, you know, you want to budget, you want to be lean and mean and um, you do everything cheap. I did. I, I, I tried to do some of that, but, you know, I, I feel when it comes to money and, and people looking at real estate, you know, don't don't be afraid to pay for a good spot because that paying a higher rent per square foot to be in a better location is going to do you better than a cheap location, you know, off the beaten path and uh, it tucked away in an old, uh, you know, office building, you know, get, I, I didn't ask you, are, are you leasing or, or do you own the, the uh, well, you know, I, I, I'm leasing right now. And I, and I guess, you know, those are, um, two separate conversations too, lease and buy and, and all of that. Um, you know, the, the like I said, the part of town I wanted to be in, was not a newer part of town. There's, you know, there's no land available. So the only way to acquire a building is is one has to be for sale and then you're buying a pre-existing building and then, you know, renovating within. So there's there wasn't anything to buy in the area that I needed to be to make my uh, business model and demographics fit. So uh, I'm leasing out of a, uh, out of a nicer retail area, but you know, the real estate price is, is, is kind of high for that area, but being there, uh, you know, has been invaluable to um, the growth of the practice. So I, I guess my point is, you know, whether you lease or you buy, it, you know, if you're on the corner lot with uh, cars, uh, you know, going 10,000 cars going by every half day and, 
you know, you're on the busiest corner of the market, you know, pay the extra money to get that space because, um, you know, that'll make itself up in, in no time. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. And I think that, that any, any DSO out there would agree. And I know for a fact that, that they'll pay a premium just to be on that corner space or in that, that, that front forward facing position over any other that that location is king and, and uh you know paying a premium is, is not a problem in, in the long long run and uh you know may, maybe uh, i'm not saying telling people to overspend but um, um it's not a bad idea to to put it in perspective in, in the long run rather than seeing the big figures up front but uh the goal to decide it can when, when when taking on a large lease or a lease uh, per square foot outside of normal, like it can influence the type of loans you can get. I know, I know some banks will not loan out past a certain amount if the if the lease amount is X amount of dollars outside of the norm. So, but but there are some circumstances where you, they can they, there are exceptions. Um, I think I think they don't like to see a, a rent amount over over sixty five thousand a year. Mm. Anything above that is, is definitely outside of norm. Although there are there are some leases that that can be a hundred plus a year. Depending on your area, sure. But uh, sure. I'm gonna do this just in discussions with banks myself. When most people think about a startup, they think that they are expensive and time-consuming. I'm here today to tell you that they are right, but it doesn't have to be. Starting a dental practice presents a list of challenges, but when it comes to making decisions about where to purchase your dental equipment, I recommend Dental Planet. Dental Planet provides affordable, comprehensive services that simplify the startup, expansion, or renovation process while dramatically improving your ROI of the entire project. If you need equipment, Dental Planet has new, factory recertified, and Dental Planet certified pre-owned digital imaging systems. As you know, a lot of your success as a startup is based on your ability to provide a great experience for your patients. The same can be said about Dental Planet. They provide telephone, email, and remote support, as well as multiple financing solutions. Dental Planet is even more affordable than many of their competitors. All products include a warranty backed by a nationwide network of service providers along with expert sales consultants and technicians. Thousands of more items, including dental supplies, are also available when you use Dental Planet. Buying equipment for your startup doesn't have to be expensive with Dental Planet. You can save between 40 to 60%. See how easy and affordable upgrading, replacing, or expanding can be when you team up with Dental Planet. Just mention shared practices to get a discount on your already low prices. Learn more at dentalplanet.com. Again, that's D E N T A L P L A N E T.com. Again, mention shared practices to get a discount on your entire order. But yeah, so anything that you would do again with, with doing a startup? Um, anything that, that you, you had worked for you that, that, that you would do again? You know, I mean, as far as things I would do again, um, you just, you know, you got to have the right people in place. You, you got to have people that are, uh, you know, energetic and ambitious and, and people persons. And, um, you know, want to see the excitement and the, and the, uh, the action of, uh, you know, the pay, the practice grow. So, you know, having, having a team that's not brand new, uh, for me, I, I hired a team that was, um, um, you know, all had experience. My, my front desk had been in dentistry for 20 plus years. My, uh, assistants had been in dentistry longer than I had. My hygienist is basically the same age. Um, so I, I, I didn't hire a bunch of, uh, of rookies, um, necessarily either. So, you know, when, when they came time to open and see patients and, and do dentistry, everybody knew what to do. So, you know, I, I had a good professional team to begin with. And, and I think that's important too, because, um, you know, you're going to need a lot of help through this process and, and you're not going to be able to do it all yourself. So, you know, surround yourself with good people and, and maybe a good team is, is a small group of people. Maybe it's just, you know, picking the right banker and picking the right, uh, the right builder, um, and, and picking the right, you know, vendor in town to work with, you know, Patterson or Shine or Getsy or, you know, whoever, you know, so, so, so having a great team, uh, that's going to help you fulfill your vision, um, is definitely important. You know, pit, the, the location obviously, um, as everyone I'm sure knows is a huge deal. You know, the, the marketing. Yeah, I was saying. I think I think you're you're touching on um, you're okay paying paying a premium for for good health. I mean, you know, absolutely. Somebody with, somebody yeah. with twenty plus years experience, 
it's not cheap. It's, it's not, no, they're not. not not cheap, but uh, worth worth it. I mean that they have that that knowledge that can guide a young owner, you know, basically a baby owner, um, you know, kind of hold her hand a little bit and kind of guide them through the ins and outs of some of this really complex insurance stuff, or insurance headaches, and uh, you know that that does come at a premium, and sometimes it's okay to do that. Yeah, you know, I, I, I kind of look at it as, um, you know, kind of like what we, what we talked about. You know, you asked about, you know, when you start taking uh, or making money or break even. I, yeah, that was kind of one of the things I was talking about was, you know, the, I think the, I think there's two things that it might be kind of over, uh, you know, OK to overpay on. And that might be, you know, a good location and a good staff, um, because ultimately those two things will make you money, you know, overpaying for uh, fancy equipment and, and uh you know, a deck chairs and counters, you know, may not uh, ever make you money, but, uh, you know, a, a great location and, and an amazing staff is, you know, something you just, you're not going to have a successful startup without. Um, so that's why, you know, you know, having the possibility of, of working one job and, and while opening in an office, I think is a good deal or, or having a spouse that can, uh, you know, has a good job and makes money too. And, and you're not expected to, um, to make the money right away because, um, you know, you're not going to get there on your own. You know, hiring an experienced team was invaluable to me. You know, it, it just like the marketing, because you can get all the new patients you want, but if they don't like your team and they don't like the process and if they don't accept the treatment, you're still not making money. Um, so I, I, I think that's definitely a, a piece that maybe may go underrated uh, or, or under discussed at times. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and you touched on uh, the family aspect of it. And, uh, and I firmly believe that, that, you know, this is a, uh, a family business, whether you know it or not. And it's either time with your family or time away from your family. And they're, they're involved, you know, whether they like it or not, because when you're not with them, you're with the business. And when you're not with the business, with the family, it's always a give and take. So it, it's always going to be a family business have them on board and, and to help support you is, is powerful because it's definitely a journey and it's not easy for, for anybody. So I think that, I think that's good advice. Um, but I think, uh, I kind of want to, want to leave it there. I think what we went over today is pretty powerful and I, and, and hopefully it motivates some of the guys out there, um, on, on how to, you know, follow your model and, and to you know, m- maybe transition their practice to something like yours, something like, you know, 40%, you know, uh, production in, in, in just implants alone. I think that, that that's amazing and, and uh, something to be sought after. And uh, w- was there anything else that uh, you wanted to add before we, before we left off here, Phil? Um, You know, not, not much. I, I think, you know, it comes down to, you know, um, you know, develop your vision, you know, get, get a good, get a good team around you, you know, don't necessarily compromise on, on what you want to do. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, anyone doing a startup, you know, has got to realize I, I'm doing it this, you know, like old Frank Sinatra said, he's like, I'm doing it my way. I mean, he, I mean, that's that's the whole point of doing a startup is that, you know, you want to do it your way. And and so that passion, that energy, that um, desire, that drive that you have is, you know, don't don't let uh, outside forces, you know, um, corrupt that, uh, you know, stay stay pure to your dream. Um, you know, it's, it's hard work. It's not easy work, but, um, I think most people come out on the other side and and they're glad they did it. You know, it may have been a lot of, a lot of hard days and close calls, but I I think, you know, most, most people are glad one, two, three, four years in that say, you know what, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what I'm doing here. And so, I mean, that's my advice is if, is if you're thinking about doing it, um, you know, do it, reach out to other people. There's lots of people, um, that, that are glad to help. Um, and, and provide you with, um, at least another, you know, set of ears to listen to and, uh, another set of thoughts to think about. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. Well, I appreciate your time and I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your experience with us. And, uh, and I, I can't wait to catch up with you later down the road and, and see how things are, are going for you. Perfect. Yeah. I look forward to catching up again. So anytime, uh, you want to you want to talk uh, dentistry or implants? Just let me know. I'm always available. Absolutely. And anybody out there, check out uh, Dr. Cope Gordon on his podcast, uh, Dental Impart Practices. And I think he has some awesome content. The guy can 
he places some some really awesome implants. I, I really admire, you know, following him on his Facebook page, and I think he puts up some quality posts. And I've definitely already learned a ton uh, j- just just following him along and and, and seeing and, and listening to his uh, his words of advice with, with the guys he had on. So I, I really appreciate you, and, and uh, I wish you best of luck. Okay, Philip. All right. Hey, I really appreciate you, uh, you know, taking the time and, and doing this tonight. And, you know, Jonas, I know it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, time and effort out of your, uh, end as well. So I really appreciate it. Hey, not a problem at all. All right. Take care, Phil. Thanks. Bye bye. All right. We are back. And Jonas, in the intro, we had talked about, um, your desire to interview Philip, uh, because of his, you know, implant guru status and how he's trying to make his implant, his practice more implant centered. And so what were your takeaways from your, your talk with him and kind of your thoughts on the whole subject in general? Yeah, you know, one of my takeaways from talking to him is, is, is the way he's able to position himself when he's speaking to patients about implants. And it's not necessarily just about treatment playing implants. It's the way that he can communicate the need for treatment to the patient, the, the authority that he can position himself you know, as that go-to guy in the community and um, really have his patients, you know, buy into what he, what he can do and then he can deliver it. Um, you know, if you, if you see any of his work, I mean, he, his work is top quality and um, definitely a lot of learning cases on there. And, you know, I'm, I'm an avid, follow, avid follower and, uh, you know, want to try to position my practice in a similar fashion to his. You know, I, I'm going to, I don't want to be devil's advocate. I don't like that word, but, you know, from somebody who's looked at a lot of practices and seen financials for people who have placed implants in their practice, um, my perspective on that is you talked about in the intro that 30% of, you know, he talked about maybe 30% as a number, um, you know, from implant procedures. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's like, yeah, that's what, that's what he quotes. Yeah. yeah, that's like on the mega high side for what I've seen. I think, you know, if so, like people like talk about placing implants, on average, it's like maybe 10, you know, tops 15% mm-hmm. of the practice revenue comes from implant procedures. Um, so from my perspective, you know, I think us, you know, GPs who want to place implants, I think it's still good to take into account that even, you know, somebody who does it and they're like an expert at it, you know, 70% of their production comes from everything else. And I think that's, you know, we're not specialists. Um, Mm -hmm. I I don't know exactly the point I'm trying to make, but I've always, I'm always underwhelmed by the percentage of implant production from, um, implants versus what they're perceived to be. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? You're right. You're right. Um, unless, unless you're a quote unquote implantologist, um, you know, not, not being a specialist in that sense of being a general dentist that only does implants, that's able to drum up those referrals from outside practices. You still got to do the bread and butter dentistry. That's always going to be there. And then you can start to kind of delve into this practice within a practice and, and start to really specialize yourself in the things you like, but you are always going to have a need to do everything else. I mean, the fillings are not going to go away. You know, you can't, you can't take out every tooth and replace it. So, you know, you gotta, you still have to uh, cater to those services. Yeah. And, you know, I guess, I guess the reason why I'm bringing it up in the first place is I always get, um, you know, maybe annoyed when, when people say like blow up your practice with implants, I think it's more of a bump, um, than it is a blow up, you know, but it's also a really nice bump. It's a very profitable bump and they're very fun procedures to do. Um, but I think the notion that you can double your practice size just by placing implants, um, is probably a misnomer. I, I agree. Um, but it's definitely, you know, if your chairs are booked and, um, you know, you have plenty of new patient flow and you want to fill your chair with, with higher dollar procedures, it's not a bad way to go, um, you know, to, to spend your marketing dollars on. Um, cause the ROI on a, you know, a short campaign, uh, you know, returns pretty high dividends as opposed to like a new patient, uh, campaign. Uh, if that makes sense. I think that's a great point. And yeah. let's elaborate on that for a second, because I think that that is one of the big, big reasons. So you have a patient, you know, your chair is going to be filled with somebody regardless. You have a patient who's going to be a higher dollar patient is uh, more revenue for your practice for the same, you know, fixed expenses, your mm-hmm. staff and everything, um, while at the same time, you know, doing maybe a more enjoyable procedure. I think that's the big benefit um, to making implants a bigger part of your practice. I don't think mm-hmm. it's the actual doubling of the practice size. You're right. Yeah, I think there's a there's a distinct difference between marketing towards a new patient and marketing towards an implant patient, you know, uh, and, and some people may not, may not put that together. They think that, um, I'm marketing for an implant patient. That's a new patient, right? 
And I go, and it is, but, um, you know, a new patient campaign is going to bring in more new patients because it has new, new patient offers as opposed to what an implant offer will get. You'll get a small number of patients, but a higher dollar figure off those. So what's um, an implant offer? What does that look like? Um, you know, a, a bundled, maybe, maybe a bundled service um, offer, such as um, either, either an all-inclusive one, uh, meaning, you know, a flat rate for implant, custom abutment, crown, and maybe even grafting. I've seen that. Or more of a debundled, maybe still bundled, but maybe an implant, abutment, and crown um, at a lower rate. But then you tack on the different fees for temporization um, and grafting. And you may have different rates for a posterior implant versus the versus an anterior implant. I've seen that too. Um, I've seen other offers. A, a great thing to do with implants is a tag tag sedation along with it. You offer implants and then uh, maybe a hundred dollars off sedation, something like that. If you do oral sedation, IV sedation in, in your in your chair, because um, in those procedures, you know, sedation is not a profit center, but it it's connected to your profit center, so it, it's great to bundle that with those bigger procedures. If so, that makes sense. Uh, from from your experience, is most of the implant marketing um, out there, you know, price driven marketing, um, where they somebody who already is aware of the fact that they need an implant and they're just looking for a place to get it done, or is there I a think, way of attracting somebody who's looking for more maybe comprehensive care that includes implants? Yeah, they're, they're two different patients. You know, there's a value patient and a reputation patient. You know, uh, you know the value one's going to shop around. They're going to call you up and say, "How much is an implant?" Other one's going to go. This guy is the authority, you know, he, he did my friend James implant or he has this many degrees with this, this prestige. Um, they're going to be two different patients coming at you and uh, you still have to, con- you still have to approach each because one's going to be turned off by, by the other. One's going to see this guy's a great rotation. He sounds expensive. The other one's going to see this guy has a value implant. He sounds like he's, he's just trying to uh, be on roller skates and interest, trying to get you in and out. So, but you still have to position yourself as somewhere in the middle, I guess, or to one extreme. That's a great point. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, he brings up a great, this whole episode, I think, brings up a great uh, conversation about implants and its role in the practice and specifically how that can relate to a startup. So I appreciate you doing the interview, Jonas. Yeah. And um, I think I like that. I think that uh, any GP out there should be incorporating implants into practice in, in any fashion, whether it be restorative wise or, or placing them, um, you know. You have the confidence to be taking out teeth. You know, you definitely have a good surgical background. You, you have enough skill, enough background to be doing implants. It's not that far of a leap. Um, you know, some people can just do it. They have minor experience in school. They can go out and start placing them. Other ones need that that step forward. Um, I talked to I talked to Philip about how he did the um, the AID Las Vegas Maxi course. Him and I both did that. Gave us a great background on, on placing implants. Um, and then he, he went ahead and did the, the Justin Moody uh, implant pathways on top of that. So, I mean, even though you do one course, doesn't mean you shouldn't do another. I think that whenever you're investing in CE, you're investing in yourself. The earlier you're doing your career, the better, the, the better ROI you have by, by doing the procedures earlier and getting better at them. That's awesome. Yep. Well, I'll leave, I'll leave you guys with that. And uh, we'll see you guys next week on the Shared Practices podcast. Thanks for listening.